Um, hello, uh, thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, and uh, as well, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm also uh, speaking from the Katsu, uh, Katsu, Siamu, Kwantlen, and other Coast Salish uh, peoples land. Um, and I am thankful uh, for that. I always give these land acknowledgements with a bit of reservation, um, just because I spent so much time studying histories of colonization and racialization. And there's always a sort of um, bittersweet sadness when you thank someone for um, something that they didn't have a choice in. <laughs> um, so, um, or fully a choice. We never want to uh, erase people's agency. Um, yeah, but uh, as a as someone who has studied uh, Black history in British Columbia and have actually, I guess, spent a lot of my um, academic career studying histories of people who essentially don't haven't left a large historical record for us to reconstruct their experiences with. Um, so I, I did my master's degree at the University of Victoria, looking at the Hogan's Alley community in Vancouver, a community that is becoming a little bit more known. Perhaps some of you have heard of it. <laughs> Many of you have probably heard of it, of it at this point. When I was doing my research, even just 20 years ago, um, far fewer people had heard about it. And in fact, I remember you know, trying to explain to, to folks um, when I was telling them or sharing with them about my research, they were often quite shocked to find out that there was a history of Black um, presence in British Columbia, um, which wasn't surprising because it was also a, a shock to me when I was 20, um, or actually it was a little bit later because I, I remember the first, uh, you know, sort of encounter I had with Black history in British Columbia was when I was a good part through a history degree at Simon Fraser University. Um, and I was actually studying, you know, uh, black, black history as much as I could at that time. Uh, it was difficult to to study African history. It's oftentimes, you know, African history is one of those ones that um, you uh, particularly hear is difficult to find professors who might be in alignment with you in terms of their viewpoints and perspectives on that history. I remember shortly before I had come to SFU at the time, there was a former colonial administrator teaching the <laughs> teaching African history. And I was told, although I never took his classes and, um, uh, I was one of those students who, if if I suspected it might be a bad, rough experience taking a history class with someone who um, might not be, uh, you know, teaching the kind of history that would dignify um, Black history uh, in the way that I thought that it should be at that age. 20-year-olds have strong opinions about these things. Um, I would generally avoid their class. Um, but I had heard, you know, that there was this sort of idea that there was something good about uh, British colonization and, and, you know, so on and so forth. And that was kind of the starting point. Um, so before, uh, which is to say, I went through most of my university degree without ever hearing about this community. Um, and I, I come around to this quite a bit just because I think the experience that I had learning about it, about my history finally, um, and learning a little bit more about Black experience in British Columbia is telling in the way that it was very frustrating. <laughs> and uh, because I, my entire life had been characterized by this sense of not feeling as though I belonged in in this particular context, right? And most of the time I had thought about or kind of imagined a time in which I would leave and join a community where black history was celebrated and where there were black people and so on and so forth. So I bring this up because I think that there are some real um, tangible reasons for including people's history. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of keeping them um, engaged and giving them a sense of belonging. I think the world right now, obviously, we look around and the world is very divided. Um, and if you would have come at me when I was, you know, 22 years old, the resentment that I was harboring for being excluded in the way that I was, um, 
it was something that could have been mobilized by someone who was clever, you know, and had the ability to perhaps make me a little bit or use my underlying resentments about being excluded and being considered less and so on. They could have mobilized those feelings in me um, and potentially, you know, recruited me for a cause that could be, um, uh, 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 you know, foster sort of this hate and, and distrust amongst community. I mention this because I think these things are growing rapidly on the internet right now. I think because we don't provide our, our young people with quality education about the contributions of different people in the world, we are in a situation where they are very susceptible to negative messaging that they might see on social media. I have a really tangible example of this. The other day, um, I teach a, a sociology class, a first year sociology class, and we were covering um, the prison industrial complex and the overrepresentation of African American men in that uh, in the prison industrial complex. And a student came up to me, an Indian student actually, and they said, "Oh wow, I watched this, you know, movie The Thirteenth, and you know, I've really had a bit of a, a transformation, uh, or I had one um, with regard to, you know." Black people. I, I can sort of see more of their struggle now and the racism that they might face in our society. But then he said, but then this morning I was looking on Instagram and I found a story of a Black man who had killed his neighbor and eaten their hearts. And I thought, well, maybe white people have a good reason for being afraid of Black people. And I thought, you know, it's incredible that we live in a world with so much access to information that one story could potentially sway the opinion of this young man. And it also really, you know, it kind of made me sad and frustrated that it is just so easy to unravel, you know, a couple of courses. I mean, it wasn't in a massive amount of time, but he had gone through, you know, my discussion about race and, you know, how, you know, the ways in which race is difficult to prove in terms of biology and so on and so forth. And one Instagram post had made him question all the research that I had exposed him to. And I think this is why um, one of the places I've come with this is a real need to take a look at the education system, which is why I'm, I've decided to come become a part of the British uh, BC Community Alliance, um, is because I think that uh, we have a tendency to think of racism as being sort of this, you know, it's a thing that undesirable people have. I think that people, naturally white folk in this society want to distance themselves from being racist a lot of the time. Um, and there's a particular kind of white person that we have traditionally thought of as being racist. Um, my argument is generally at this point is that our education system is so fundamentally racist <laughs> that it produces racist people. And it's not necessarily based on, you know, their skin color and so on and so forth. I think it's easier for people to, um, who belong to a race, um, the dominant race to abuse the sort of power that they, you know, they get through going to the education system. But when our, the, the educational experience I had was so dominated by European history, by European norms, by European standards, by European conceptions of what knowledge is, um, that I, I, I find it very, in my opinion, very natural that we'd see the growth of racism in schools, especially among young white men. Um, right now who are, you know, I think in many ways legitimately feeling a little bit more threatened. They're feeling a little uncomfortable. And they've been exposed to very little information about Black people or any other um, people outside of Canada oftentimes um, that would dispute any of the bad information that they get online. So, you know, the BC Community Alliance actually is an organization that came out of this one racist incident where a kid um, a teenage boy talked about bombing all black people. He used the N word. Um, and that we're all, you know, dirt, dirty and stinky. And I was, um, I wasn't surprised. I hear this quite a bit. Um, the research that I do, I oftentimes am doing research online and so on and so forth. It's, you know, um, it's actually uh, sadly becoming normal to me. Um, I get called the n-word quite frequently um, <laughs> if I'm online doing whatever you know research I'm doing. Um, what saddens me, uh, what continues to sadden me is how we uh, propose to deal with these situations um, and 
uh, in this particular situation, a, a young black woman came forward. Um, she shared, you know, her experience of encountering this, you know, racist media post talking about killing all black people. I'm going to wrap this up. Not a lot of time. Sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, she then suffered a lot of backlash. And there was a lot of conversation about, you know, this child and we need to punish this child, 15 year old white person. Um, for me, I, I don't want to be a part of change that involves scapegoating 15 year old boys who are going through you know, all kinds of craziness otherwise. And, you know, um, for in my, in my opinion, don't have a lot of reason to question the information that they get about black people because it's poor quality information. Um, and I think that what we really need to start looking at in these situations is how does a boy go through, you know, eight years of an education system and is so ignorant about black people that he would use these very, very uh, ugly stereotypes, like they're all stinky and smelly and stupid. Um, uh, you know, clearly if he'd have been exposed to even uh, some basic information about what people of African descent have contributed or, you know, the kind of rich cultural histories that we have, um, despite the fact that, you know, over the past 400 years, it's been a bit of a rough go for us. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I find this sad. So my, my feeling is now um, we need more than curriculum in the education system. Um, we need to rethink uh, how we, the ideal human that we're actually trying to create with this education system. What are the standards? What are the values? Um, what is knowledge? Um, and how does power accumulate around, around certain ways of knowing and interacting with the world, i.e. science? Um, are there other ways? Um, and uh, I think once we start to get at these more fundamental questions, um, that we will also be, of course, providing all students with a kind of better edu education, because I think right now our education system is not really keeping up with the times. Um, uh, but I think uh, that we need to focus less on curriculum and more on let's get people in rooms talking together from different cultural backgrounds when we're trying to come up with new curriculum. I would hate to see a situation in which, you know, a consultancy was hired, they come up with a curriculum for black history or whatever, they put it in the hands of teachers who are totally ill-equipped to teach it because they've never really thought about black history or anything else before. Um, and then, you know, putting it into a school system where the administrators are ill-equipped to deal with racism and the students, uh, you know, and teachers don't really have anywhere to find support, to teach, to learn, so on and so forth. This is a big problem. It needs to be resourced. <laughs> so when politicians talk to me about caring about racism, my general response is, where's the resources? Where's the support? Where's the money? Because until we start actually showing that we actually care by resourcing initiatives that are focused on making real changes in the education system, we are not going to get anywhere. We are going to create situations in which people can build careers in which people can throw around fancy language with regard to diversity and inclusion and have not really any understanding of what they mean. I mean, for example, inclusion. Do we really want inclusion? Do we wanna be included into a system that has for the last 300 years been solely focused on sort of building up white men? I, that's not the kind of system I want to be included in actually. Um, uh, a few things like that. So uh, <clears throat> more systemic change, more resources. <laughs> Uh, thank you for listening to me.